Good morning. Welcome to the third Lenten service. This week's opportunities. Monday, 6 p.m., trustees. Wednesday, uh, 5.30, the Lenten soup and study. Our mission basket for March will benefit the Hands of Christ Food Pantry and the altar flowers are given to the glory of God and Luke Fitton for his 25th birthday, given by Matt and Cara Fitton. Are there any other? If you want the flowers, last, day last day to order your Easter flowers. Trustees, it's 530 for trustees tomorrow. Okay. Would you please stand for the call to worship? <clears throat> Lenten travelers, why are you here? Yeah. Gathered to do the work of worship. Lenten travelers, what happens when we gather to worship? We listen and proclaim, we sing and pray, we repent and encourage. Lenten travelers, how do we do the work of worship? We bring all that we are to be present to God and one another. Lenten travelers, come, let us worship God together. Come, so that we can delight in life together with God and one another. Lenten travelers, come, let us worship God together. Come, come let, let us, us worship, worship God, God together. together. Amen. Amen. And our hymn is, All My Hope is firm, Firmly Grounded, number 132, verses 1 through 3. Join me in our prayer of confession, printed on the screen. With hearts of sorrow, we come before you, O God, to confess what you already know. We have failed to keep your laws again and again. We have followed our own selfish will, rather than your holy and life-giving will for our lives. We have twisted your decrees and institutions to suit our preconceptions and interests rather than our own. Forgive us, O God, 
and cleanse us from hidden faults, that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all our hearts may be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. God shows steadfast love and blesses to the thousandth generation those who follow God's ways. In love, God sent Jesus to bless and redeem God's people. God forgives us our sin and restores us to new life. Let us rejoice in God's mercy. Amen.
presence of the Lord. Our first scripture reading is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 through 25. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who, bring, who are being destroyed, but it is the power of God for those of us who are being saved. It is written in scripture, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and I will reject the intelligence of the intelligent. Where are the wise? Where are the legal experts? Where are today's debaters? Hasn't God made the wisdom of the world foolish? Is God's wisdom, he de, in God's wisdom, he determined that the world wouldn't come to know him through its wisdom. Instead, God was pleased to save those who believe through the foolishness of preaching. Jews ask for signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified which is a scandal to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's power and God's wisdom. This is because the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Our choir will sing in Christ alone. Our gospel reading comes from John chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. He found in the temple those who were selling cattle, sheep, and doves, as well as those involved in exchanging currency sitting there. He made a whip from ropes and chased them all out of the temple, including the cattle and the sheep. He scattered the coins and overturned the tables of those who exchanged currency. He said to the dove sellers, get these things out of here. Don't make my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, passion from your house consumes me. Then the Jewish leaders asked him, by what authority are you doing these things? What miraculous sign will you show us? Jesus answered, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. The Jewish leaders replied, 
It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But the temple Jesus was talking about was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said what he had said, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you. In our children's moment, Tara and Alyssa Crumwitty. Good morning. How are you? Let's talk about something that's a little gross. Have you ever had a cold or had allergies where your nose was stuffed up and you had to breathe through your mouth? Some yes, some no. Do you like that, being all stuffed up? Me, me neither. So what do you do to unstuff your nose? Yes. Maybe even take medicine? Why do you take medicine and blow your nose, perhaps? I only, I only blow my nose. <laughs> okay. To get healthy? Does someone else, usually a parent, give you medicine to take sometimes? Okay. And at least in the past, for some of you, maybe when you're even younger than you are now, would a parent help you blow your nose by putting a tissue to your nose and telling you to blow your nose? Yeah. So when a parent gave you medicine and helped you blow your nose, that person was helping you get your breathing all cleared up, right? Thank you for talking about gross stuff with me. I think it will help us think about today's scripture story. In today's scripture story, Jesus is starting his life's work, which we might call his ministry. What Jesus did during his ministry was teach people how to breathe or better pay attention to God. Jesus also shared God's healing love with the people around him. One way to think about what Jesus did then is to say, that Jesus helped to clear things up. Jesus helped clear up people's confusion about God, and Jesus helped people's sicknesses get all cleared up. And in today's scripture story, we hear about another area that Jesus helped clear up. That place was the temple. There were all these things in the temple that were stuffing it up, that were keeping the people from being able to pay attention to God. So Jesus just went in and cleared it out. It's sort of like Jesus held up a tissue to the temple and said, Temple, you're too stuffed up. You need to blow your nose. Sometimes our lives get stuffed up, just like the temple got stuffed up. And when that happens, we have a harder time paying attention to God. Just like when our noses are stuffed up, and we have a hard time breathing. But today's story reminds us that when we invite Jesus into our lives, just like when our noses get all stuffed up, Jesus can actually clear that up, just like he cleared up the temple. This is one of the ways that Jesus helps us to better pay attention to God. And that's the good news for today. Let's pray. This is a repeat after me prayer. Dear God, thank you for Jesus who helps us clear up our stuffed up lives so that we can pay better attention to you. Thank you and amen. Thanks for coming up this morning. Have a good day.
with me as I pray with you. <clears throat> Gracious Savior, you have the words of eternal life. Bless our hearts and minds in the hearing of the word and the word proclaimed, so that we might know your presence and power more fully, so that we may be filled, as our song declares. We pray in the name of the living word. Amen. This um, scripture today, the John scripture, is not about bingo. Maybe that never occurred to you, but when I was growing up, this gospel reading often brought bingo to mind. Well, it wasn't the game itself, it was the notion of playing bingo to raise money in the church. Looking back, I think it was more about Catholics than bingo. You see, I grew, I grew up Roman Catholic, and my mother always told me that, not always, but often, <laughs> told me that every Catholic family had a Mary in it. Well, I never met another Mary until I was in middle school, and that's because all the other Marys went to private or Catholic school, and we couldn't afford to do that. Well, that's all beside the point. Growing up Catholic caused me not to appreciate this scripture very much as it sounded anti-Catholic, anti-bingo. Was it pronouncing that bingo was proof that Catholics were up to no good because they played bingo in the church and their families didn't? My friends, families. I worried every time I heard this passage, every three years, that Jesus was going to come to our church and overturn the bingo tables, sending the cards flying all over the church basement and spilling the little numbers out of the cage that spun them around. Stop making my father's house a marketplace, Jesus would shout as he tripped over our cash boxes. But it's not about bingo. Yet Jesus' disruption that day in the temple was a powerful sign of Jesus' disruption of the way things were socially. We usually think of this story coming near the end of Jesus' life, after he had ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey, as it does in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. In all four Gospels, yes, it appears in all four Gospels, it seems to be a crisis scene, a confrontation that gave the authorities the evidence they needed to arrest him. Jesus of Nazareth was a troublemaker, probably part of a zealot movement trying to overthrow the government now, it's true that in the first three Gospels, Jesus' outburst in the temple was one of the last straws that led to his arrest, trial, and crucifixion. But in John's Gospel, which is quite different from the first three, the story comes in chapter 2, early in Jesus' ministry, as our children's sermon leader told us. What's going on here? Perhaps Jesus chased the money changers out more than once? Was it a habit with him? Watch out, here comes that fellow from Nazareth again. Grab the cash box. I think it's more likely that all four gospel writers knew the same story. But John saw in it a particular meaning. This wasn't only a political catalyst leading to Jesus' arrest. For John, the gospel writer, Jesus' actions in the temple pointed to the heart of who Jesus was, what he had come to do. It had to come at the beginning, not at the end. Now, a closer look at this chapter brings us deep into the heart of Jesus. There are two stories in this chapter connected by a little verse about Jesus and his family going to Capernaum. The first story is Jesus' miracle at the wedding of Cana. You, you all know that story, I'm sure. When they ran out of wine and Jesus told the steward, as, at his mother's behest, to fill six stone jars with water. Then he told the steward to taste the water and ah, the water had been turned to wine with such bouquet and resonance that the steward wondered why the host had saved it till last. Now, I think that that story has a deeper significance than our wanting to invite Jesus to all our parties. 
John tells us a particular detail that we sometimes miss in our fascination of, with all that wine. The stone jars that held the wine were used for the rites of purification. So Jesus turned the purified water into wine. Now, I think that's significant. Most people don't notice that little tidbit. By the time of Jesus, an elaborate system of purification had been developed. Some things were considered pure and others impure. For example, women were impure seven days after the birth of a son, and get this, 14 days after the birth of a daughter. Dead bodies were impure. People with blemishes such as leprosy were impure. Certain foods were impure, and almost anything sexual was impure. The list had gotten very, very long. It's been said that Jesus was here challenging this vast purity system, as it was a system that had profound implications for all of life, not just temple life. The effect of the purity system was to create a world with sharp social boundaries between pure and impure, righteous and sinner, whole and not whole, male and female, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile. Changing water into wine was not so much the way to a great party as a way of breaking down social barriers, a different way of seeing the world and God's presence in it. As the song says, God is in this house. I bet that it was no accident that the miracle at Cana was the first sign Jesus performed in the Gospel of John. It's also no accident that the next of Jesus' actions takes place in the temple. For the temple was at the heart of this purity system. The animals being sold there were for sacrificial purposes. It's not like the sale barn in rural towns with spring lambs and hogs on the auction block. These animals were required for sacrifice, so it was okay that they were there. And there were economic implications because poor people couldn't afford to buy the best animals or bring them with them. And money changers were an essential part of the system. Turns out that it was idolatrous for Jews to use Roman coins stamped with the emperor's image to buy their sacrifice. Thus, the money changers weren't simply making change for a 20. They were giving pure tokens, or seemingly pure, in exchange for impure Roman money. Now, I need to interrupt myself here, because this sounds like Jesus was opposed to all things Jewish, and that was definitely not the truth. Just as my childhood taught me to hear this story as anti-Roman Catholic, Christians too often hear this story as anti-Jewish. But Jesus was deeply Jewish, shaped by Torah, committed to teaching in the synagogue, and he was even called a rabbi. And he was not the first Jew to cry out against abusing temple offerings and misunderstanding purity. Centuries before Jesus, remember the prophet Micah asked, will God be pleased with thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you to do, but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. And the prophet Amos raised a similar cry. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them, says God. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And years later, God called the prophet Jeremiah to stand at the very gate of the temple and speak. Hear the word of the Lord, he cried. Do not trust in these deceptive words, for this is the temple of the Lord. Act justly. Do not oppress the alien the orphan, or the widow. Then I will dwell with you in this place. Turns out, Jesus challenged the purity system in almost everything he did. 
cannot be accidental that so many gospel stories talk about him getting his life dirty. Story after story, person after person, like Israel's greatest prophets, Jesus longed to draw people back to the heart of God, back to the first commandment. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This is a commandment grounded in relationship. The relationship between God and God's people. Remember who you are, Jesus was saying, and even more importantly, remember whose you are. Your worth is not measured in categories, but in God's liberating miracle, bringing you, his first audience, out of Egypt, out of exile, out of whatever bondage you were in, and to us, how out of whatever binds you now. Jesus' life and ministry challenged the rules that named things and people pure or impure and declared that such rules were being overturned by God's compassion, God's righteousness. It's this conflict between purity codes and compassion that shapes Jesus' ministry. You know, in the message and activity of Jesus, we see an alternative social vision, a community shaped not by the tradition and politics of purity or difference, but by the ethos and politics of love and compassion. This call to compassion runs throughout John's Gospel like a stream of living water. Do you remember compassion for the Samaritan woman at the well? She had been considered impure by bloodline and behavior. That is why she comes to the well midday, because she would be alone there. Compassion for the woman accused of adultery, threatened with stoning. She had been surely considered impure, and the written laws said so. Compassion for sheep who are not yet part of God's fold, those Gentiles that we hear so much about. Who are those people in our communities? It's not so strange, then, that the temple cleansing comes early in John's Gospel. For it helps to define what Jesus' mission was, not so much to clear the temple, but to clear the way for people to see God's love in their lives. Interestingly, when we come to the last week of Jesus' life, and we will soon in this season of Lent, the Gospel writer John again departs from the other Gospel writers. Do you remember in the story we often call the Last Supper? John has no words about the bread and wine. I don't know if you ever noticed that. Jesus does not say, do this in remembrance of me in the Gospel of John. Instead, what does he do? He gets down on his knees and washes his disciples' dirty feet. Talk about impure. This was the task of a servant. Once more, Jesus overturns the tables and in a way questions, who is the master? Who is the servant? Jesus then says to his friends, I give you a new commandment, a new rule, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Not by maintaining boundaries, not by naming some pure and others impure, not by protecting the church from getting dirty or, or cluttered, but by this love you have for one another. You see, it's not about bingo. Good thing. No, it's about the deep, disruptive, and challenging love and compassion of God in Christ.
Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks for your compassion beyond measure. Draw us so close to you that we can rest secure in your love. Yes, overturn the tables of every system that names some of your children as unclean. In society, but in our own lives as well. Daily comfort and disrupt us with your love. Amen. And now we have our offertory. Let us offer ourselves and our gifts to God. Wisdom of the world tells us to hoard what we own, O oh God, while you invite us to share what we have with those in need. Accept these gifts for your purposes that we may be your servants in the world. Amen. And I think we do the pig at this point, right? And I seem to remember that we have a lot of birthdays this week. Is that right? Let's see, Luke and Cameron and Lincoln and Pam and Jacob and Kara, and Kathy and Delaney. Are any of you here? Would you like to contribute to the pig? Boy, this pig is heavy. I have helpers today. Oh, good. <laughs> Very good. Shall we sing happy birthday? <laughs>
Thank you. And the other contributions, maybe we have some anniversaries I don't know about. My daughter had a birthday this week too. She turned 11. Well, actually she turned 44. She was a, <laughs> a leap year baby. Now we share joys and concerns, I believe. Do we have any that we'd like to voice? We have a microphone traveling around. Uh, my daughter, Denise, in Ohio, had her preliminary surgery uh, Friday, and this coming Friday is going to be the actual surgery she's going to have. So what, is, like what is her name? Denise. Denise. Uh, my son Tim is in India for his job, and I would just like prayers for safety for his safety while he's there and for his safe return home. Are there others? My oldest brother, Joe, is having open heart surgery this Tuesday, if you keep him, him in your prayers, and his wife also, Karen, and all of our siblings, except one, are traveling to be with him. So safe travels, too. Thank you. Well, let us pray. God of glory, we praise you for your presence in our lives and for all the goodness that you shower upon us in Jesus Christ. Especially we praise and thank you for promises kept and hope for tomorrow, for friends, for family, for the wonders of your creation, for those who have gone before us, for love from our spouses or significant others, and for children. We thank you, too, for our faith and for the church. God of grace, remind us that we are all your children, for we are brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ. We offer our prayers this day, too, for those whom we love or are concerned about, for Denise, for persons securing new jobs, for those traveling, for those having surgery. We pray especially for those that we sometimes or often forget, for those making new adjustments, trying new things or having to, people who have lost hope, those who mourn this day. For victims of tragedy and disaster. Those who suffer because of war. Those in, in the Middle East and the Ukraine and wherever else in the world there is war. For those making decisions politically, socially, personally. Let us pray. God of loving presence, compassionate parent, understanding, healing one. Continue to journey with us during these days, last weeks of Lent. We ask all this in Jesus' name as we pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.